do that. By the way, on our app, you can, you can review all the testimonies that have been given. So if you ever just want some encouragement and you want to hear how God has changed the lives of people in our church, you can go and watch those videos, and they're just really, really wonderful. All right? Okay, well, let's pray together. Father, we come to you today, and we ask that you would just bless our time in your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how powerful it is. We thank you that it is able to change our minds. It's able to renew our minds. Daily, we are inundated with all number of philosophies and even theologies. But Lord, help us to take our philosophy and theology from your truth. So God, open our hearts today as we look into your word. We thank you for this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy a couple thousand years ago. And we're quite astonished, Lord, that it is so relevant for today. And Father, as we desire to be a mature church, and as we look in this particular letter that speaks to how we can be a mature church, help us to be a a church that prays and prays well, and especially prays well for the lost. So thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us. Fill me even now with your spirit that I might be able to articulate your truths in such a way that brings you great honor and glory. And Lord, fill all of us with your spirit that we might have ears to hear your truth today so that we could and will be conformed more to the image of your Son. Lord, help us not to sit in scrutiny of your word, but help us to sit in humility that we might learn and grow. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prayer is the backbone of any good and godly church. Without prayer, the body of Christ lacks the necessary power to accomplish anything of eternal substance. We have to recognize that prayer is that critical for us. Prayer is the vehicle of communication between God and us. What a privilege, as the hymn says, what a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. What a friend we do have in Jesus. Imagine that. The the God who created all that is, the God who called all things into existence by the word of His mouth, the God who holds all things together by His awesome power wants to talk with you. He wants to speak with you. He wants to talk with me. Who are we? That he would want to speak to us. You and I. Personally. He desires this. And Paul. After walking through this introductory material. And especially talking with Timothy. About the importance of dealing with the false teaching. That that Timothy is dealing with in Ephesus. He's turning back to Timothy now. and, And turning his attentions to the priorities. That Timothy should deal with. As he pastors the church in Ephesus. And prayer is at the top of the list. Prayer should be the priority of any local congregation. Pastor and author Warren Wiersbe said this. He said, if I announce a banquet, people will come out of the woodwork to attend. But if I announce a prayer meeting, I'm lucky if I get the ushers to show up. Well, I want to tell you that I am thankful this morning. I am thankful that this is not the testimony of our church. I'm not here to berate you about your lack of prayer. I think we are a prayerful church. There's always room for improvement. We can always grow. But did you know that we have some 150 people in our connection groups in this church that are, their priority is prayer? I think that's amazing. I think that's wonderful. Dave Van Enk's group, man, go to his group and you will see a list of comprehensive prayer items. When you come to our group, you see prayer. I mean, we have prayer pies. It's just wonderful how God is using his people to pray in our church. There is substantial and meaningful prayer taking place in our church. And, 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 and it's because it's a priority for God's church. But today's sermon isn't about the necessity of prayer as much as it is about about, um, who we should pray for and how we should pray and what we should be praying for. 
And that really leads to the main thought that I want to try to explain to you today. And that's this. The church must pray with godly priorities. The church of Jesus Christ must pray with godly priorities. So Paul, in his continued mentoring of Timothy, lays out three areas the church should focus her prayer on. And the first is this. Number one, we must pray for all types of people. We must pray for all types of people. Look at the text again that Aspen read for us just a few minutes ago. It says, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So, as I mentioned earlier, prayer is a priority for every local church. And this is what Paul means. He starts, literally starts this off. He says, first of all, Timothy, first of all, I want you to understand this. But notice he doesn't just tell Timothy to have a a church that prays. He urges them. He says, I urge you. I, I, I want to compel you. This is so important. And he urges them to pray in specific ways. Do you see the list that he gives here? He gives a list starting with supplications. A supplication is asking God to meet a need. God delights in us humbling ourselves and asking him to fulfill something that we cannot fulfill on our own. God loves to help us in our time of need. And oftentimes, what what do we do when something tough hits? What do we do? We go into fix-it mode, right? We start to try to fix the problem. But our knee-jerk reaction shouldn't be that. We should actually go to our knees in prayer. He also mentions the word prayers. This is a a general term that has the idea of worship. Uh, One commentary said this, We are praying to God. Prayer is an act of worship, not just an expression of our wants and needs. There should be reverence in our hearts as we pray to God. Prayer is an act of worship. So we have supplications, we have prayers, we have intercessions. This means to draw near and speak intimately with God. Sharing the burden of our heart with the one who can hear and do something about what we are asking. We intercede for those that are near us. We pray for those that are in desperate need. We intercede on their behalf. And we draw near to God and speak with him intimately about that. And then, of course, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving uh, is uh, thanking God for who he is and, and what he has done and what he continues to do. Do you go through your life looking for God's sightings? Do you walk through your day recognizing that God is providentially and actively at work in your life? See, We can easily be very myopic and just kind of look at all the tough circumstances that we face. And we can be negative Nellies and and just whine and complain about all that stuff. But you know what we should do? We should be a people of thanksgiving. And we should look at our lives through the providential hand of God. And we should see these God sightings, these God events that take place each and every day. That cause our hearts to well up, not with bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, but with thanksgiving, with joy, recognizing that God is still on the throne. He is still active. He is still working. He's working on the macro level, and guess what, folks? He's working on the micro level in your life as well. The God of the universe, the God that's holding all of this together, cares about you, cares about everything that you are facing. And we should be thankful for that. Look for those thanksgiving, those God sightings so that we can be thankful. A thankful heart is a heart that is content and at peace with whatever life throws at it. Right? So, these components of prayer are common in Paul's instruction about prayer. Look at Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Paul says this to the church at Philippi, do not be anxious about anything. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Don't be anxious about anything, right? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. See these words he's using again, these same words? 
let your requests be made known to God. And it goes on to say, and the peace of God surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It's beautiful. So this is, this is the formula of prayer, the how, if you will. But what about the who of prayer? Look again at the text. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 says this, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For all people. Paul wanted Timothy and his congregation to understand what the scope of our prayer should be. We should pray, we should supplicate, we should intercede, and we should give thanks for all people. All people. Yes, all people. Certainly we cannot pray for everyone by name in the world, but we can pray that all people in the world would have the opportunity to hear the gospel and be saved. Could we pray about that? Do you think that would be important for us to pray about? I do. But on the other hand, we can pray for all the people in our circle of influence, and we should, I believe, pray for them by name. Pray regularly for your family by name. Pray regularly for your neighbors by name, your coworkers by name, your classmates by name, your friends by name, your church family by name, your ministry partners by name, your connection group family by name. Do the hard work and create lists of people in your circle of influence and pray for them by name. That's what I do in my prayer time. I have a list on my on my phone that Apple Notes at. I'm not trying to promote a phone or anything here, okay? I'm not getting a kickback from Apple. But I use their app, and I have different categories, and I have lists. I have all of your names, hopefully. I'm trying to keep up with it. All of your names in there, and I, once a week, pray through the church directory. I'm praying for my family by name. I'm pray This is hard work. It's hard work, but it is good work. We need to be lifting one another up in prayer by name. In addition, the text tells us that we are to pray for kings and those in high positions. Oh boy, do you mean to tell me I have to pray for the president of the United States that I per maybe don't have the same political view with or other people? Oh my goodness. I mean, I am a lot better at complaining about politicians than I am praying for them. But that's not what the text tells us, does it? The text says we are to pray for those in high positions, kings. Why, why would Paul emphasize this with Timothy? Well, first of all, do you know who was the king of the land at the time of this writing? Now, you may have your beefs with different politicians in our country. But the king of the land at the time was Nero. Do you know what Nero thought of Christians? Not very highly, right? He would, and you can read this on your own, but he would take Christians and he would dip them in tar and he would put them up on posts and he would torch them so he could light up his gardens. Now, we may have our differences in our politicians, but I have not yet seen anyone be torched in our country for being a Christian. Now, maybe that day will come, but today's not that day. But even if it were that day, Paul would still admonish us not to gripe and complain, but to pray. That's convicting, isn't it? We need to be people who are praying for those in authority. And Paul wanted Timothy and his congregation to pray for a guy like this? Are you kidding me? Yes. Why? One thing prayer does powerfully is, is it changes our heart towards others especially those in leadership. When you pray for someone, your perspective changes of them. I remember my pastor used to say that. If you don't like me, he would say, would you pray for me? Would you please pray for me? And I think that was a wise ask. Because we need to be praying for those in authority, especially in the government authority that what Paul is talking about here. It changes our hearts toward them, especially, especially those in leadership. When you pray for someone, your perspective changes about them. And in Nero's case, he was in desperate need of salvation. 
He was in desperate need of salvation. By the way, this attitude change this attitude change will change the way you live. Look at verse 2. For kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. One commentary said this, the early church was always subject to opposition and persecution. The, the world we live in, the America that we live in right now is utopic. And the first century church knew nothing about what we enjoy. They were under opposition and they were under persecution constantly. So it, w- so it was wise to pray for those in authority. Quiet refers to circumstances around us, while peaceful refers to the calm attitude within us. The result should be lives that are godly and honorable. Right? If we are peaceful inside of us because of, because of our trust and relationship with God, regardless of what happens outside of us, we can have peace, can't we? That's the secret. The secret isn't let's change all of the circumstances. That's, see, that's what our world wants to do. Our world wants, oh, you've offended me. You need to change. That's not, that's not Bible. The Bible says the world is offensive. I need to change. I need to change my trust that I'm going to trust the one who loves me and gave himself up for me, regardless of the circumstances that are going around about me. In the next point, we're going to see Paul gives three reasons why we should pray. But for now, realize that your prayer and the prayer of this church corporately, it's, it's purposeful and it's substantial. And I want you to understand that. God tells us that we need to pray on behalf of those that we know and those that we don't know. We must pray for those who are saved and for those who are not saved. We must pray for those people we like and those that we do not like. Those in authority over us and those who are underneath our authority. Do you get the point? The primary responsibility that we have as Christians and as a corporate body is prayer. Spurgeon said this, the pillar on which our ministry rests are under God the prayers of our people. The prayer of our people. This this is the business that we are to be about. We are to be a praying people. ABC, we must never grow slack in our prayer, especially for one another and those outside of our fellowship, those who need salvation. And yes, I am so pleased with how many people in our congregation are involved in prayer through our connection groups and other means, thus praying corporately. But there is room for you to join us in prayer. There is room for that. Don't let the pressures of life keep you from prayer. The pressures of life should drive us not just to prayer, but to corporate prayer. Prayer with one another so that we can bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So here's an application point for you this morning. Pray for all kinds and types of people and do it with the people of this church. Pray for all kinds and types of people and do it with one another. Pray with one another for all kinds and types of people. The church must pray with godly priorities, and this is, this is one of them. We must pray for all types of people. Number two, we must pray for people to be saved. We must pray for people to be saved. Look at verses 3 and 4. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Praying for all types of people is good, according to Paul. It should be a significant part of the Christian life, but it also must be part of the corporate body, the corporate church as well. Just a side note here, and it's something I I believe our elders are trying to take very seriously. There are two major responsibilities for the elders. They They are to be given to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. That's that's our job description. Prayer and the ministry of the word. Prayer, literally, is one half of the responsibility of the elders of this church. And I'm glad to say that we are working hard at praying for this congregation. 
All of this prayer is pleasing to God because it shows our absolute dependence on God. That's what prayer does, right? Prayer, prayer demonstrates that, that there's an issue, there's something, and there's something I can't do about it, but I have a God who can do something about it. And we submit ourselves to Him. It's our dependence on God. Notice what Paul says about God. He says God is our Savior. Do you see that? You know what that means then. The logical conclusion is you need saving. And I need saving. He's God our Savior. He's not a God who just leaves us to our own devices. He's a God who is about saving people. Right? That's what He does for us. Yes, more than anyone else desire more than anyone else, God desires for his creation to trust him and to follow him. John Piper calls God the great missionary. He's the great missionary. We get to participate with him in that process. He's the one who saves. He desires to use us in the process, but he's the great missionary. And isn't it a great privilege? to work alongside our God in that endeavor. What a privilege. He's our Savior. And this Savior God not only desires for His children to pray for all people, we saw that previously, I want you to pray for all people, but do you see this? He desires for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So there's a lot of alls in this passage here. He wants us to pray for all people because He wants to save all people. So what did Paul want Timothy and his congregation to pray for? Well, the salvation of the world from top to bottom. He wants his people to pray for all people that they might be saved from eternal hell. Now, to be clear, we know that the scriptures, from the scriptures that not all will come to salvation, but it is offered to all. Most are content in their sins and do not desire to turn from their sin and be saved to have a saving, loving, re restorative relationship that God offers. But that's not God's fault. If, if, those, if those determined to remain in charge of their own soul, then it's their fault. And we are often tempted to blame God for not saving everyone. No. But God did all that He could do while remaining. This is very important. In regards to salvation, God did all that He could do while remaining true to His loving, merciful, and just character. God can't just let anyone into heaven. He can't. It's against His character. Right? And by the way, if God were to... People say this, well, why doesn't God just get rid of evil? Well, folks, if God just were to get rid of evil... He would get rid of a lot of people because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So in his immense wisdom and patience, he is working out his salvation for, for humanity, right? So we don't blame God for not saving this. No, he, he is being true to his loving, merciful, and just nature to save us, he has to work within those parameters. He sent his son, the second person of the Trinity, uh, the Godhead, to be born a slave. Think about this, the God of the universe, the Son of God. He was born to be a slave and die a criminal's death on a cruel Roman cross to absorb the Father's wrath and just nature and to be satisfied with His work on that cross so that you could go free. And then we have the audacity to suggest that God could do more to save us? No. For God so loved us, He sent Christ. What a beautiful truth that is. God set me free from His just Wrath in 1991, 33 years ago he did that. And my life has never been the same. God did, God did all of this so, he, so I could be saved and so you could be saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, a very familiar verse to many of us. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and it is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. God's gift of salvation motivated by his graciousness towards me and you through the agency of faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. His salvation of me is not accomplished by me, but by Christ. Yet it is offered to me so that I can enjoy eternal life 
with the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's the gospel. Friends, if you are born again here this morning, I wonder what your prayer life looks like. Are you praying for the salvation of the world? Are you praying regularly for the salvation of the world? Are you praying for the salvation of your family and your friends? Are you regularly, faithfully bringing the names of people that you know who need eternal salvation to the throne room of God? Are you, if God is the great missionary and we get to partner with Him, one of the tools that He's given us is prayer. Are you praying regularly for those that you know need Christ. There are several well-documented stories of individuals who came to faith through the faithful prayer of their family and friends. Let me just give you some examples. George Mueller and the conversions of his friends. George Mueller was a Christian evangelist and the founder of several orphanages in Bristol, England. He's renowned for his faith and dedication to prayer. Mueller prayed for the conversion of five friends over many years, three of them came to faith during Mueller's lifetime. One of the remaining two accepted Christ shortly before he died, and the last friend came to faith a few years later after he died, demonstrating the power and the perseverance of prayer. Monica, the mother of Augustine, uh, she of Hippo, is, is another classic example. Augustine led a wayward life for many years, but Monica, his mother, never ceased to pray fervently for his conversion. Her prayers were eventually answered when Augustine experienced a profound conversion, becoming one of the most influential theologians in Christian history. Augustine himself acknowledged his mother's prayers as a key factor in his spiritual journey and in his conversion. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, his father and his grandfather. Spurgeon was one of the most famous Baptist preachers in the 19th century, and he had a heritage of prayer. His father and his grandfather were both ministers, and they both prayed earnestly for their children and grandchildren. Spurgeon attributed much of his own spiritual fervor and success in ministry to the prayers of his father and grandfather. Reese Howells' intercessory prayer. Reese Howells was a Welsh intercessor and a, the founder of the Bible College of Wales, was known for his powerful ministry of prayer. One of the remarkable stories from his life uh, and his, his life of prayer involves a young boy who was deeply involved in witchcraft. Through persistent and fervent prayer, Howells saw the boy delivered and come to faith in Christ, showcasing the transformative power of intercessory prayer. What about the salvation of C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis is, the, is a renowned author and Christian apologist. He came to faith largely through the influence and prayers of his close friend, J.R.R. Tolkien. Although not a family member, Tolkien's persistent discussions and prayers and encouragement played a significant role in Lewis's conversion from atheism to Christianity. And of course, Lewis became one of the most influ influential thinkers in the 20, 20th century. You ever considered all of these people were being prayed for and that God gloriously answered those prayers? These stories highlight the significance and the impact that faithful, persistent prayer can have on the lives of those that we care about. I know that there are some in this room today that are discouraged with their children and their grandchildren that are not walking with the Lord. It's a heartache, isn't it? It's that desperate heartache. And God wants to hear from you about it. And he wants you to not grow weary in doing the good work of prayer. Even in Mueller's case, they came to faith after, after he passed away. My mother-in-law, Trudy, prayed faithful for, faithfully for me uh, that I would become a follower of Christ before I was ever born again. And she was so confident that I would be saved that she later told me that, that I didn't stand a chance for not becoming a Christian because too many people were praying for me. Who are you praying for? Are you growing weary in your prayer? Don't grow weary in your prayer. Do you have faith that God will bring these people into his family? I want you to do something very specific for the next foreseeable future. I want you to start a list of your 10 most wanted. 
I, I want you to do this. Write it in the book that you have. Make a bookmark. Do whatever you need to do. I want you to start a list of the 10 most wanted that you believe need to come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's 10 people in your circle of influence that need salvation. I want you to pray for that list at least once a week. Don't overwhelm yourself and say, I'm going to pray every day, every day, every day, because then we fail and then we give up, right? But you can do once a week. So let's make it a goal of praying for these people, your top 10, once a week. And then in that prayer time, ask God to give you and others opportunity to share the life-giving gospel with them. Move the hand of God through your prayer. And see what God will do. Part of your prayer and the reason God has you to pray is to grow you in your faith. God doesn't need your prayer. Does he? If God needs anything, he ceases to be God, right? But he wants to use you on your knees to move his hand to save those people that are in your life that need Christ. The church must pray with godly priorities, folks. We must pray for all types of people. We must pray for people to be saved. And then number three, we must pray that all understand the truth. Look at verses 5 through 7. This is, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. By the way, why does he say that? Because he's constantly under attack for his own credibility. There are false apostles out there that are saying Paul is not who he claims to be. So Paul is saying, listen, Timothy, I am not lying about this. And you tell those people in Ephesus that I am not lying about this. This is serious. I am telling you the truth. He says, I was appointed a preacher and a teach I was appointed a preacher and apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul was called by God and determined to communicate the truth of the gospel to all that would hear. What is the truth? Well, he tells us in verse 5, and we do well to pay attention to this sentence. Let's break it apart here. He says, for there is one God. The truth of biblical Christianity is there is one God. In an ancient culture that embraced polytheism, Christianity stood with Judaism in being monotheistic. There's one God, not multiple gods. There's not Zeus and Apollos and all these different gods out there. No, there's one God and one God only. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. The Lord is what? One. And he goes on to say, And there is one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. The word mediator simply means go-between. Now I'll share a little bit of family history with you. One Christmas, we had a rough go. This was years ago. Angie and I were married. All of our kids were small. And we were at my parents' house. And my brothers had a bit of an altercation. One brother was mad at the other brother. Now if you know... You probably think I'm just a mild-mannered guy and I come from a very mild-mannered family. Okay, first of all, these guys are both bigger than me because I'm adopted. And so they're good Hollanders and I'm just a little wee man. But there was a serious, serious difference of opinion. There was coarse language being thrown around. My wife scurried our kids off to the bedroom because it was getting ugly. And I don't know what possessed me, but I stood between my brothers and said, enough, we cannot do this. And I tried to help them be reconciled. That's what a mediator does. That's what God does. That's what Jesus Christ does. He stands between God and man. There is enmity. There is a warfare going between God and man. And tr Jesus Christ, the man, stands in between God and man as our mediator. By the way, God's not at fault for this one, is he? But God sent that mediator so that we could have a reconciled relationship between God and us. 
Isn't that amazing? The text goes on to say, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Ransom is a payment given instead of a, a slave or a prisoner. That is, in substitution for him or her, the person holding the slave accepts the payment as a substitute. According to Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law held us captive in its condemnation, but no one but Christ could pay the price to release us from that bondage. By the way, my brothers are good now, okay? I don't want to leave you hanging on that one. All right? Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's not just our mediator. He is the ransom payment so that we can go free. And then it says, which is the, which is the testimony given at the proper time. In other words, just, as, just at the right time, the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. That's what, that's what Galatians 4.4 4 says, but when the fullness of time, just the perfect time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus came at the proper time under the law to demonstrate that He could live under the mandates of the law, something you and I cannot do, to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Sins, sins we could only truly understand, those sins that we could truly comprehend because of the law. The law points out to us how we are insufficient. And now Paul and others were, were the witnesses to this amazing truth and are testifying to everyone that they can. This is why he says in verse 7, For this is why I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, a teacher uh, to, of the Gentiles in faith and truth. God, God appointed Paul to be a herald, someone who calls out the truth of the gospel, someone calling out for repentance. God appointed him an apostle, someone sent with a message, a very important message, a life-giving message. God appointed him a teacher, someone who explains the text of Scripture and the things of God to a specific people, the Gentiles, right? God appointed and sent Paul to go out to the outermost parts of the world so that all the world would hear and understand the truth. This truth must be very important to our God if He wants all people to hear and understand it. Truth? When Jesus was standing before Pilate, do you remember this situation? Look at, look at verses 33 through 38 in John 18. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, and he called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you, do you say this of your own accord, or did others... Tell, say it to you about me. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. And then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. To what? Bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Very important. And what's Pilate's response? What is truth? Well, how contemporary. What is truth? People today tell us that truth is relative to the person. Truth is whatever the individual determines it to be. Apparently, 2 plus 2 equals 4 only when it feels like equaling 4. Feelings and emotions are the authority over the truth in this day. But friends, let me give you some hope this morning. Truth is not relative. Truth is not subservient to feelings and emotions. Truth is squarely rooted in one place and one place alone, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 is clear. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it was Paul's mission in life, appointed by God, to preach and teach the truth, teach faith about Jesus Christ, who is the personification of truth. Friends, as we understand Paul's mission, we must also understand that this mission of truth was rooted in prayer. We cannot miss this. Look at these amazing and humble, humble words that Paul offers as he challenges those in the church of Ephesus regarding putting on the armor of the Lord. Look at what he says to, for them to do. 
He says, and take on the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, and with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints, and also for me, that that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Can you believe this sentence here? The great apostle Paul recognizes how much he needs the empowering prayer of the saints in Ephesus to accomplish the ministry that God has entrusted to him. He wanted the saints to pray for him so he would speak boldly the truth. So that people would hear and understand the truth. Bernard of Clairvaux said this, Since man on account of the flesh could understand nothing but what was of the flesh, behold, the word was made flesh that man might be able, even by the flesh, to hear and understand the things of the Spirit. Do you remember that top ten list I challenged you with? That we should pray for them on a regular basis? Well, guess what? There's a specific way that you should pray for them on your list, and it's right here in the text. Pray that they would understand the truth and place their faith in Christ. Those people, you need to pray for them that they would understand the truth and, and, and place their faith. Don't, don't go to your prayer time for those people on your list and say, Dear Lord, bless so-and-so, or Dear Lord, be with so-and-so. He's already with them in the sense that he's omnipresent. We don't need to pray that. What we need to pray is a specific prayer because God answers specific prayer. And so we need to pray a specific prayer. We need to pray that they understand the truth and place their faith in Christ. Listen, folks. The church must pray with godly priorities. We must pray for all types of people. We must pray that all people would be saved. And we must pray that all understand the truth. What if every Christian in this room this morning took the main idea of this sermon seriously? What if we in our morning worship service, in our connection groups, in our youth ministry, in our children's ministry, in our men's and women's ministries, in our deacons and elders' ministries, all the ministries of this church. What if we took this seriously and we all prayed for all types of people to be saved from the wrath of God and discipled and understand the truth? Do you think that if we prayed that kind of prayer, that God's answer for that kind of prayer would be a yes? Do you believe that that would be a yes? I think so. I think he would say yes to that. And so we need to pray this as individuals. But as a church, we must in every ministry incorporate this prayer. And by God's grace, we will. And by God's grace, we need a bigger vision of what God wants to accomplish through us. And maybe even a bigger building. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for this challenge. God, help us. Help us to bathe, not just individually, but bathe these things corporately in prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.